Okay, so today's lecture is um, is about edit distance and matrix chain multiplication. At least those are the two applications we'll look at, but it'll also introduce a, a more general and useful technique. So let's just start. Is, um, okay, so this first topic is about um, trying to find ways to kind of compare strings and define a nice distance function over strings. So just some applications like, um, I'm sure we all use uh, use GitHub. Uh, I use GitHub, for example, for all our, our notes and stuff. Um, and uh, in GitHub, it'll actually, um, you know, show you from one version of a file to the next, kind of what are some of the changes and, and give kind of succinct uh, summary just based on highlights, right? Uh, so it wants to do this. Of course, this is sort of a short example, but, you know, code can be very, very long, especially in a company or something like that. Okay, so, yeah, the point is we want to highlight these differences. And so, so GitHub is, is running on Git, and Git is sort of uh, using as a subroutine or maybe some, some modification of a Unix command called diff. So, so diff, uh, I'm sure many of you guys have used before, uh, takes as input uh, you know, two files, and uh, we'll compare the two files and try to come up with a relatively compact description of the differences uh, between the two files. Uh, it's also very, very fast. Okay. So, so version control is, is, is one basic application where we want to be able to compare uh, strings. The second uh, application might be something like genetics. So, so you know, uh, we're all uh, encoded in our in our DNA uh, by the strings of four letter alphabet A, C, G, and T, uh, which represent uh, certain molecules. And uh, you know, the idea is that somehow this very long sequence, uh, like really, really long. <laughs> I think I I forget how many bytes total it is, but it's either gigabytes or terabytes. Um, uh, information kind of gives the instructions uh, how to put us together and how we behave to some extent and blah, 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 right? So there's a lot of information packed into, uh, into DNA. Of course, I'm not the right person to explain it all, uh, but okay, but why do we want to, uh, you know, it's uh, biologists are, are often interested in kind of taking two uh, strands of DNA and trying to understand how similar or how different they are. Okay, so why? What are some applications? Uh, I mean, this is useful for you know analyzing hereditary traits, you know, from from one offspring to the next. Maybe only some of the DNA changes, and you could you know correspond to some of the difference in features in the people you're studying or something like that. I guess uh, they're also kind of maybe used. Uh, this, to distinguish species, you know, you know, once the DNA is sufficiently different, then you might say, okay, these are two different kinds of birds or something. Uh, there's these kind of nice problems where you try to build, try to reconstruct uh, the evolutionary tree, where you take as input sort of DNA from all these different animals and, and try to guess how they, they uh, emerged. Okay, so anyway, so those are our two applications. Now, um, there's at least two kind of natural ways uh, to try to define the distance or similarity uh, between strings. So, so one is maybe simpler. The simpler one is called handing distance. It really only makes sense if the two strings have the same length, okay? Uh, but the idea is that uh, with handing distance, you just kind of line up the two strings and uh, you see how many characters uh, are off. So if I have kind of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, this one string, and the other one is A, B, C, E, F, G, D. So I just kind of took the D and put it at the end. Uh, we'll see that, you know, the A is okay, the B is okay, the C is okay. And then we start getting some mismatches. So D is different, E is different, F is different, G is different, right? So, uh, okay, so, uh, Maybe you guys can drop in a chat or say it out loud. What would be the handing distance between these two strings? Excellent. All right, so that's four. And the handing distance is four. 
uh, even though all I really did was remove one letter and append it to the end. And so misalignment is kind of painful. All right, a second kind of metric, a little bit more kind of complicated to define. It's not, I feel like, so it's not as kind of cleanly mathematical. It's called edit distance, okay? And the idea is you sort of look at these two streams and you think of like, imagine you're actually typing on a keyboard. How many times would I need to insert a character or delete a character or maybe replace one character with another to convert one string into the other? Okay. So uh, let's take like let's take the same example A B C D E F G and A B C E F G D. Um, what would be the edit distance between these two strings? Three, two, two. All right, two is starting to. Oh, we got three again. So. One way to do it in, in three steps is, is we can uh, we can delete D and then we can insert D at the end. And now you've converted X to Y. And I'm pretty sure you can't do better. Uh, so assuming that is the best, uh, then the answer would be two. Okay. All right, so that's a different way uh, to maybe try to you know, measure the difference or similarity between two strings. So for what it's worth, uh, both Hamming distance and edit distance, I mean, the word distance is at because they, they actually both satisfy all the axioms of a metric. So for example, if distance, whether it's Hamming distance or edit distance is always non-negative. If it's zero, then the strings must be the same, okay? It's symmetric. Uh, the edit distance from X to Y is the same as the edit distance from Y to X, because roughly you just replace every insertion with a deletion and kind of go backwards. Um, and you also have uh, the triangle inequality. So if you actually want to, if you're starting at a string X, right, and you edit it to string Z, you know, and this takes some like K edits, and then you edit that, the string Y, L, then all together, that gives you some edit, if you combine the two edit sequences, now you have some edit sequence getting you from X to Y with K plus L uh, operations, edits. So that means whatever is a minimum is at most K plus L. Right? So you have also triangle inequality. So these things are pretty well behaved. It's easier to verify a triangle inequality for Hamming distance. Okay, all right. Now, if I put these things uh, side by side, um, what I want to suggest in particular is that Hamming distance is, is, for some of our applications, not so robust. Okay, so uh, does anyone want to suggest some weaknesses in the Hamming distance definition? Any weakness that might come to mind? Uh, so if the uh, characters are one character is, is inserted, uh, for example, at the head of the one sequence. And uh, uh, so then the having distance are, um, is going to be maximum. Yeah, so uh, I mean, there might be some coincidences, but in general, just a small misalignment, like I take one letter from the beginning of a string and I move it to the end, so all the letters shift up. And it's only handing distance explodes, even though it's a relatively small edit. And, you know, for some of our applications, like uh, version control, right, you might just go in and make a small change in the middle of your code. And so everything shifts a little bit. And in your mind, it was a 10 second edit. So the handing distance blows up and everyone in the company wants to know why you've upended the, the code base or something, right? Same with, you know, biology, as I understand, like actually like photons are like shooting off of your DNA all the time. So like letters just like get dropped and inserted and like mutations. Um, but it doesn't, I mean, there are some extreme cases, but often the, your body's actually kind of robust and, and can survive. It doesn't change too much despite some small changes. So, uh, right. So, so misalignment um, leads to huge handling distance, which sometimes for some application doesn't correspond to our intuition of similar or different strings. Whereas, whereas uh, edit distance 
you know, that small misalignment, okay, that can just be corrected by, you know, roughly the number of edits equal to the number of steps you need to create the misalignment. Okay, so that's maybe better suited. But there is something nice about Hamming distance. Uh, it's very simple. It's very easy to compute, right? Because you just go through, you march down and you just compare uh, the two letters. So that's just a loop and that's going to be very fast, right? But you take that compared to, to, uh, to edit distance, and edit distance is like the answer to an optimization problem, right? Like all the possible ways to do edit sequence. Even that example before, we had some disagreement, uh, or, or you know, it wasn't even obvious totally that those two edits before, and that was relatively small. So, um, you know, it's not even clear we can compute this in any reasonable amount of time, however, you know, intuitive and, and nice it is uh, from a modeling perspective. Okay. So that's the, that's what we're going to um, uh, try to do. And, and without worrying as much about running time initially, we're just going to maybe first try to implement this thing recursively, just to make sure we have some kind of like correct algorithm that works, however slow. Okay, so, all right, let's see if I can get some interaction out of you guys. So if I wanted to uh, write the recursive spec uh, to compute the edit distance between like uh, two strings, x1, m, one m, m character string and one n character string, y1 to n, what might be a suggestion? You can say it out loud or you could drop it in the chat. Find the base case. Oh yeah, but uh, I'm looking for that sentence first. So given the two two synthesis, uh, return the uh, humming distance between them. Oh, we're doing edit distance. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Alright, so we just declare some sentence is equal to item. Edit distance, and here I'm assuming that edit this, okay, min edit distance is a little bit redundant because edit distance is a min, but I'm just kind of overemphasizing the main point uh, between x and y. Okay, something like that. As usual, not too clever. We're basically just restating the question, but now it's all okay. set up. Oh, uh, yeah. Why do you why do you need a uh, min? Well, we don't. It's this is redundant. I, I only just put it here to overemphasize the point. Uh, oh, I see. It, yeah, it is re, it is redundant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I got it's really question. big number of yes. Question. So th does that mean that uh, we could probably have multiple, um, you know, like let's say uh, answers, and then we choose the minimum? Yeah, there's many ways to to edit one sequence to another, right? Like for example, one way that always works but probably isn't great is I could just delete the entire first string and then reinsert the entire second string, right? That's not too efficient, but that is a possibility. So there, there's many possible edit sequences and it's, it's not clear at all whether we can do this efficiently because there are really so many different ways to go about it. Okay. Yeah, but our goal is to find a minimum. There is some minimum because at the very least it's at least zero. So it's bounded below, so that means there exists a minimum. Okay. All right. Okay, so that, that's a reasonable sentence. Um, okay. All right. So now, now this is the part that, that's maybe more fun. I want to implement this function. How might I go about it? Uh, base case x y uh, hamming distance is zero. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay, so x is equal to y. Return zero. I think I mean, if, if all the characters are the same. I think I think we want something like uh, n equal zero or one. Okay. 
Let's try that. Okay. Uh, if m is equal to zero, so that means x is empty, then. And then uh, the edit distance is zero. So return zero. Ah, it returns zero. Not quite actually. So if x is an empty string, right? If I'm comparing an empty string. Why, to, why is it not necessarily empty? Uh, why, yeah, why is it not necessarily empty? I see. So in that I case, written in n. Yeah. OK, good. That's one base case. Other base case. So if m equals one. Oh, yeah, or, uh, m equals one, too. But I, what I had actually in mind was the symmetric thing. Uh, n equals zero. OK, so we're just handling the two cases where one string is empty. OK, and all you can do is just insert or delete all the characters uh, to get there. All right. OK, so. Good. All right, so those are base cases, not too exciting. All right, so all right, so in general, you have two non-empty strings. Oops. In general, you have two non-empty strings. So we have like um, you know, x and, and y. Uh, you know, I'll draw it over here actually. So we have x and y. So this is like um, a, B, C, D, E, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, Y is similar, but let's look at the case where the first letter is different. Okay, so we'll have two cases. One is where the first letters are the same. And the other one is when they're different. So let's look at the case where X1 is not equal to Y1. Do. Could we return one plus the edit of the remaining of the two strings? Okay, so some kind of one plus edit and then just something to do with the remaining strings. Okay. Okay, so this kind of makes, okay, so let me try to part. This one is that, okay, you recognize that since these are not equal, you're going to have to do something, it seems like. So that seems like the one plus, okay? And then we want to do a recursive algorithm. So we want to do some kind of remaining strings. Okay, so now let's, let's expand. What might be the remaining strings? I mean, uh, is it like this? Is that what you have in mind? That's what I was thinking, yeah. Okay, so this would be, um, okay. So this would be if you did a substitution. So you're gonna rewrite A as F. So now the first letter becomes F and then recursing on the rest. Okay, so that would be X two through M, Y two through N, okay. And this is sort of like uh, doing a substitution. All right, how's that? Suppose this were the actual two strings. Is that what you would want to do? You could also just remove the first character from either one of the strings. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's think of editing X to become Y, uh, uh, just to keep things consistent. So uh, I can remove, well, if I remove A, so if I remove this guy, then I'll still have the same problem that the first letters mismatch, uh, but we can still try it. So I can try removing A. So that's one plus, okay, so that's another alternative, right? One plus X of two through M, 
y1 through n. And what this is doing is deleting the first character. All right, so that's a possibility. There's one more way it might. You could just insert F in X. Ah, okay, we can, we can insert F. We can insert F here, right? And these kind of get matched up and then we advance to the rest of the string. So that'll give us one plus edit X, uh, yeah, one and Y two to end. Okay. All right. So we have at least three possibilities to sort of rectify the fact that the first letters don't match. So this is insert Y one before. Excellent. Okay. All right. So we have three choices, right? Uh, which one should we do? Can we take the minimum of the three? Ah, okay. So in general, it's really hard to tell at this stage how your current decision is going to impact your later decisions, right? Even something is very appealing now, you know, oh, you'd have to kind of really fully analyze the entire strings and all of different possibilities to really know it's the right choice, which seems way too hard to just do in a static way. So this will guarantee whatever's the best one, we get it. So we're not gonna think too hard and we're not worried about running time at this stage, okay? So I know that if the first letters are different then whatever's the optimal edit sequence, it has to do one of these three options. I don't know which. It's either going to do a substitution, an insertion, or a deletion just to get the first letter, just to address Y1. That's really all I know. I don't know which one it'll take, so I just enumerate all the options and take the best one. So it's a very conservative. Okay. All right, let me, let me shrink this a little bit. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah. Do you mind if you explain again why the insertion should be written that way? The recursion for the insertion uh, case will be written. Yeah, yeah. We just stop. So, okay, so. Uh, all right, so once I've inserted F here, now the first letters are the same, okay? And then I just have to figure out how to edit this sequence, the remaining part here, which is the original X1, into the rest of Y. So this is Y2 to N, and this is X1 to N. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, right, so you. excellent, excellent. All right, so that's, One case. Just trying to make it smaller so no more room at the bottom. So if we turn this. Okay. Now let's look at the remaining case if x1 is equal to y1. So, yeah, again, we have some kind of something like this. So, edit x2 to m, y2 to n. Yeah, yeah, so it seems like the easiest thing is to just match these up and then recurse on the rest. So, we can do edit, uh, edit x2 to m, y2 to n. 
Okay. Now, okay, this is kind of an annoying part. I always, whenever I say this, someone gets annoyed, but all right. So it seems intuitively obvious that you should just match the first two letters and move on, right? But I guess in principle, you could, if you really wanted like insert A at the beginning of X and then recurse, or you could delete A and recurse. And it doesn't really seem like there's any good reason to do so. But if you wanted to sort of take this shortcut and just say, oh, this is good, you would need to like write a paragraph to justify it and right to, to really make sure there's no possible mistake. So if you wanted to be lazy, you can go ahead and add uh, the redundant things that you probably don't want to do anyway. And you can prove it, but it would take some time. So in other words, even though you obviously should just match and move on, since I'm too lazy to prove that always works, I'm going to go ahead and add the two other seemingly silly possibilities. I'll suggest that for other problems when things are more subtle, it's good to just be safe and enumerate extra options anyway. Okay. So this is not technically necessary. I could have spent a little bit of time arguing that you should always match. But that was my point. Okay. But in any case, this is conservative, right? Of course, you should just match and move on. But just to be safe, I've added lines for inserting and deleting at that first letter. Okay. All right. Okay. So good. We've written some recursive code uh, to compute the edit distance. It's pretty conservative because it's basically enumerating all the options. Right? It's not really very clever. All right. So that I think agrees with, with this. All right. Okay. So what is the running time of this algorithm. Or how would I model it recursively? Tn minus one plus on. Tn minus one plus on. Okay. Where does the Tn minus one come from? We are left with a string which is one length less, lesser. So, like this, for example, we have one less. Oh, I guess n is the combined sizes. All right. Let's let. Well, it's okay. So n would be denoting k plus l here. All right, um, okay. But I should point out that uh, you actually make three recursive subcalls. Okay, three times. Yeah, three times. And where does the on come from? Because you have plus ones. So, okay, it's not it's not on, then it's constant, I think. Okay, it's constant. I think, uh... We have two t n minus one and one t n minus two. Okay, that's true. You could do a little bit better. Okay. Well, I'm just going to be lazy. I agree with that, but it won't make too big a difference in the next stage anyway. So okay. you could do, yes, I agree. You can do t n minus two plus two t n minus one. It'll be a little bit better than what I'm going to do, but you'll come to the same dire conclusion. Okay. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I know. So if we, if we draw out the, you know, Wouldn't it be something right? like uh, m plus n minus one rather than just n? Yeah, so I, I I I didn't set this up correctly, but I'm using n to denote the sum of the two. Right? Oh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. I should have done KL, but I, I messed it up. Okay, this kind of works. This is kind of cleaner in some ways. All right, so um, uh, what's the point? Okay, so if we do a a, a recursion tree. Right? And then you have problems with sub n minus one, and so we'll go down to n minus two, right? So here you have like one unit of work, you have three units of work, and you have nine units of work, and so forth, right? You always have three to the i units of work at level i. How tall is this tree?
n. Uh, it's going to have height n. So when I sum all this up, it's going to be roughly 3 to the n. Okay. If we had done something slightly better, you know, you would have at least had 2 to the n. The point is that um, we're looking at an exponential algorithm. Okay, so it's not super fast, but that's not too surprising, right? It's a very conservative algorithm. It's basically trying everything. It's more or less brute force. And for the same reason that it's obviously correct because it's trying everything, it's also slow. All right, but we're still making some progress. All right, so let me let me summarize uh, our situation. Okay, so okay, edit distance is a good model. I would love to implement this thing efficiently, right? I do know that it can be computed recursively. That's what we just did. Right? It is computable. We can write a code. It's not the longest code in the world. It's relatively simple. Uh, but a recursive algorithm takes exponential time. Okay, so we made some progress. We're comfortable with correctness. You know, like in, during the first week of class, we would have been quite happy at this point, right? But now it's week two, three. I don't even know. Okay, I think it's week three, and uh, we demand better running times. So, all right. So the general kind of the general high level question, and I think the high level question is interesting is how do you take a recursive algorithm like this, you know, one that is appealingly, you know, from a top-down level, so clearly correct, so it has some appeal, but it's slow. How do you make a recursive algorithm fast? That, that's the question we're really going to ask and answer today. Okay. Does anyone want to take a shot at this? All right, excellent. Caching. It's exactly the answer I had in mind. There's lots of fancier names for it. Okay, caching. We're going to take this relatively simple algorithm, recursive algorithm, and we're going to overlay some caching, and it's going to make a big difference. Okay, so what do I mean? All right, so it's a very simple idea. We are going to save the answers to every subproblem. Okay, I ignore this. Number one thing. So the idea is that, you know, as I do these recursive calls, I'm going to save my answers whenever I solve a subproblem. So I never have to solve the same subproblem twice. So when I create some kind of lookup table or something like that, where I save my answers whenever I solve it, and then when I find myself stumbling back into that same subproblem, I'll first check to see if I've solved it in the lookup table. Okay. I mean, it's, it's almost common sense, right? I don't want to do the same thing twice. And, and that's all we're doing. So the first thing I want to do, just a little bit of uh, custodial work, is I'm just going to rewrite what we did so that the parameters are a little bit more cache friendly. Okay, so not not too nothing too exciting. So I'll go quickly. Um, okay, so suppose that uh, the strings x1 to n and y1 to n are sort of fixed globally, right? They're kind of a little bit out of scope, right? So Make sure that reference point is, is completely clear. So we're looking at these two strings, x and y, that I want to compute the edit distance of. And I'm going to define edit a little bit differently, just in terms of the parameter. Uh, edit ij is the minimum number of edit operations to convert x i to m to y j to n. Obviously, this is just a superficial adjustment. And okay, given that, uh, I'm just going to re-implement what, what we did again. This exact same things so don't get thrown off. Um, uh, it's just that the arguments I'm just using i and j instead of x i through m and y j through n. Okay, so that I can refer to a subproblem by the two indices is a little bit simpler. Okay, so same code, I've just re-indexed the subproblems. Okay. All right. Okay. Now here comes. I think the interesting part, I'm going to take that simple code that we did together, although it's been re-indexed, and I'm going to augment it with sort of like a lookup table. So let me let me zoom in here. Okay. I'm assuming that sort of outside this code, I've declared a, a, an m by n table because there's really m by n subproblems. And I'm calling it a because I think of an a for answer. Okay. So there's some table outside the scope. 
the local scope of this recursive function. Okay. And now, okay, the, the base cases, I don't need to do anything because they're constant time anyway. But now, when I go into an interesting case, right, this is where all the fun happens. I'm not doing base cases. I first check to see if I've already computed the answer. So I guess I, I think of the table as like initially being initialized to null or something, you know, denoting I haven't done anything yet, right? And then, you know, if it is null, then uh, I do the same code as before, except rather than returning it, I save it in the table. Okay, as well as in the other case, when they match, I save it in the table. Okay. And then I return whatever stored in the table, which is what we just calculated. Okay. So as a result, you know, if I hadn't computed this problem yet, then I have to make three recursive subcalls. But if I have already solved this problem once before, there's an entry in AIJ, there's some data there, I don't make any recursive calls and I just return that value and I just shortcut it. And I don't make recursive calls if I've already solved that's a problem. You can use hash tables and stuff too, but you know these these problems are structurally so simple. You can just create an array that's simplest. Okay, hash tables also get murky because they're randomized and stuff like that. I'd rather avoid it. So for the problems we'll see, at least for the short term, um, you know, an array is just fine. Okay, so okay, so does that code? Any questions about the code? Okay. So the high level idea is simple. That's the point I want to stress. All right. So I, I'm claiming that this is going to make a big running time improvement. Let's see if that's true. Okay. So to calculate the running time, we're not going to do a recursion tree anymore because it's really not doing tons of recursive calls like before. I mean, a recursive recursion tree is just going to overestimate. I mean, it doesn't really capture the, the this whole caching thing. So instead, we're going to analyze our running time by organizing by subproblems. So I think of one choice of i and j as a subproblem. Okay. And so what I want to do is say, figure out a how many subproblems there are, and b how much time I'm spending on each generic subproblem, excluding the recursive calls, which are addressed in other subproblems. And I multiply those together and I get the total running time. This is arguably simpler than recursion trees. I'm just you know, chopping it up by subproblems. Okay, so how many subproblems are there if I'm looking at uh, us, you know, and by n? Okay. All right. M n subproblems, right? Because I goes from one through m, or really one through m plus one. J goes from one to m plus one or one to n or something. It's roughly m n. Okay, and how much time do I spend on each subproblem in the worst case? Okay, good. So it's just constant time, right? Because it, you, whatever, you just make three recursive calls and you add up some, you compare some numbers. It's just constant time. All right, so overall, the running time becomes. We're using M as N, but oops, come on. Oh, and then. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, very simple, right? And, and very appealing because, uh, you know, from a design perspective, I wrote the recursive algorithm first, just worried about getting correct. And then I just added this generic caching layer. And suddenly it's efficient too. Like, the great thing is, like, how obviously correct it is because it's more or less doing brute force. Except you don't have to pay the running time cost of brute force because of caching. Okay, so this is like a very, very nice, cute trick. Very much a computer scientist trick because what we're really leveraging is the use of additional memory. Okay. All right. Any questions? So the final answer that we are looking for in this new algorithm, is it the whole matrix A or just the final element M comma N of A? Yes, yeah, so 
at the end of the day, we, we would actually return. This is a good point, and I'll stress this in upcoming slides. At the end of the day, we would actually return, I guess, cached edit. This would be on the outside, something that calls it. One, one is the answer we're really looking for. Because the way we wrote our sentence, one, one is the edit distance from x1 to m and y1 to m. Yeah. So that's actually an important point. Other questions? Yeah, so I'm not too worried about iterative stuff. In fact, you're going to be discouraged from worrying about anything iterative. I'm trying to focus on a top-down perspective. But it is true, you can, you can reverse engineer some loops out of this. All right. So, okay, so, so this is, um, you know, very generic, right? I mean, I use edit distance as an example because it has lots of applications, uh, but the general, you know, the recipe is, is much broader than that. If your recursive algorithm has a polynomial number of subproblems, right? And assuming that the work in the recursive algorithm is, you know, some modest amount outside of the recursive calls, then you apply caching and you get a polynomial time algorithm. Right? You just head off this kind of exponential explosion that you get from all these recursive stuff. And so, all right, so uh, a very simple thing. Now, now in this class, um, this is sort of like a stylized problem. Like we'll have a bunch of dynamic programming problems and you also kind of look at a, a problem and recognize that it's applicable to dynamic programming. So for this particular, oh, as I mentioned, dynamic programming is the more common name for caching, but I feel like it's a little bit of a dramatic name for a simple idea. Anyway, uh, so, so I'm going to subscribe to like a relatively simple template just to expedite these solutions and, and so that you can solve more problems quickly instead of writing forever. Okay, so these are really the only steps we're going to be asking for in your solutions. All right, step one, you guys already know. Right, is to figure out the recursive spec. Write down the sentence of what you're trying to implement. Okay, make the parameters clear. Step two, you guys also know. Implement the algorithm recursively. I'm not worried about the caching, just the high level design. You know, the correct thing, correctly implementing the spec. The first and most important thing is that it's correct before I'm worried about running time. Okay, so this is relatively short pseudocode. Sometimes it can even look like a formula. Step three, just mention anywhere. So you've already written this short recursive code that you're going to use dynamic programming or caching, right? You don't need to write the code where you actually allocate a, a table and then add the table to the code because that's mechanical. We do the same thing every time. Okay, so I'm just saving you that time. And just mention you going to use dynamic programming and we would just think, oh, okay, there's, we're going to save the answers automatically. Okay. Uh, for analyze the running time, that's often broken down into something like number of subproblems times the number of uh, uh, time per problem. Other situations with graphs later will become a little bit more subtle, but actually, for now, I think that, that recipe will always work. Uh, five. So this was the, the point that was raised. Uh, you know, because you're going to write some recursive algorithm, but there may be some difference between your algorithm and the original, what the original question asked for. So explain how to use your algorithm to actually answer the question. So for edit distance, that would have been like, oh, we call edit one one to get the answer we're looking for. So it's usually just a very short sentence. But sometimes you actually do something a little bit more clever. So something to keep an eye out for longest increasing subsequence in an example where you actually have to loop over uh, some choices. Okay, and then lastly, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, is a proof, uh, but the proof is essentially by induction. It's very similar to basically what we're doing in the first week of class, right? So it's just showing that your, your algorithm is really the first two steps are correct is really all that's needed in the proof, okay? And then when it comes to things like uh, tests or, or sometimes on homework, where we rather just have you do a bunch of questions fast instead of, you know, really getting bogged down in proofs, so you might say, oh, you can skip the proof and we'll treat your recursive spec as an induction hypothesis and fill in the rest. 
just so we can sp spend more time solving problems. Okay, but you guys already know that. What are the things we 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 are not asking for? Okay, but but you might see in other classes or other settings. You know, I, again, I'm not worried about the code that actually implements the caching. If you just say you're using dynamic programming, I know what that means. So just give me the shorter pseudocode where I can focus on the correctness, because that's where most of the ideas really are. And then it's kind of clear you can always add a layer of caching around it. Uh, you could take, for example, edit distance and think about how to reverse engineer a loop where you start with the problem like MN and you kind of build all the way back so you don't have to use recursive calls. I don't care about that. Like I actually prefer recursive calls because for me, I can see the correctness of the algorithm in a top-down fashion. So none of this iterative code, also no copying the iterative code from geeks for geeks or whatever else. Okay. Uh, so we won't you won't get many points for loops. And then lastly, um, you know, I'm not too worried about space usage. So you know, the table, we just save all the answers. There's some problems here and there where you could potentially use less space by being more shrewd. Uh, in certain ways, but those are more really more exceptions, a little bit besides the point. So I'm not going to stress that. The space usage is always at most the running time. That's good enough for me. Um, and I'm really more focused on the correctness and the recursive thinking and top down thinking and solving really the content of the problem. So those are the three things that you might see in other situations, but we're not worried about. Okay, so I'm just streamlining this a little bit. Okay, that's good to be aware of. All right. So much for that. Here, I guess uh, I put a sample solution in, in the book, but you know, potentially uh, the point is that it's not, it's not necessarily too long. Here's that sentence. Here's a quick code. Oh, here you call edit one one. Here's a running time analysis. I put the proof here. This proof is a little bit cumbersome because of all the cases, like, oh, what if X1 is equal to Y1, blah, blah, blah. So it took a little while to write out, but it's not too interesting. It's just a proof by induction on uh, the indices. Okay. I, I'm really most interested most of the time in, in the first four points. That's where most of the problem solving, the fun part happens. Okay. All right. Uh, it's all laid out in detail in, in the notes. Um, so, so much for that. Okay. So I have another application coming up. But any questions about what we just did? Okay, great. Okay, so the next application um, has to do with multiplying like many matrices together to produce one matrix. All right, so, okay, so if you have uh, two matrices A uh, and B, okay, and it's important that uh, the number of columns of A lines up with the number of rows of B, for the product to be well defined, okay, you output uh, a matrix C. The number of rows in C is the number of rows in A. The number of columns in C is the number of columns in B. Okay, so I mean, I just drew an abstract picture, but this is filled with numbers, right? So this is representing a grid of numbers, okay? And to calculate, you know, one point. Uh, the I, ith row and jth column of C, the idea is that you go down the ith row of A and you go down the jth column of B and you multiply all the values together. So this first value gets multiplied. That's hard to see. Um, this first value gets multiplied with that first value. And then that second value gets multiplied by that second value, the third value, the third value, uh, and then add it all together. So that's what this formula is doing. I kind of think of it as like zipping up along the common dimension, the inner dimension, so to speak. Okay. So that's how you compute just one of these entries in C. So each entry in C represents a loop. Okay. And then there's many entries in C. So if you have N1 rows in A and N2 columns in A, and B has N3 rows and N2 columns, how long would it take to compute all the entries of C? Yeah, N1 times N2 times N3. So there's N1 times N3 choices of coordinates in C, and each one is taking a loop of size 
and two. Okay. I, I know you guys have all seen this likely before, but just warm up. Okay, so, all right. Now, of course, if you can multiply two matrices, you can multiply three matrices, right? And you multiply them two at a time, okay? And it doesn't matter, you can work it out. It doesn't matter if I multiply these two first and the third one after, or multiply these two first and I multiply the third one after, Either way, the, sh the output is going to be the same. Okay, so it's associative, the matrix multiplication is associative. It doesn't matter which pairs you do first, you'll get the same output mathematically speaking. Okay, so if you're just concerned in the contents of the output matrix, it, it doesn't matter at all which pairs you multiply first. Okay, but, okay. Algorithmically, there could be a difference. Okay, so I have a choice. I can multiply the first two matrices first or the last two matrices first, right? So if I multiply the first two matrices first, right, something like this, okay, those first two matrices will become this big square matrix in an intermediate step, right? And then I do that last multiplication to get the purple. So the, the first multiplication here takes n1 times n2 times n3 time for these dimensions. And then doing the last two takes n1 times n3 times n4 time. You put this all together, you get n1, n3 times n2 plus n4. Hopefully I did that correctly. All right. But if we did it the other way, and I multiply the second two matrices first, okay, this will actually collapse as drawn to a smaller square. Okay. And in particular, this last multiplication will become much smaller. Okay. So this running time, the first one here takes n1, n2 times n3 times n4 time. The next one took n1 times n2 times n4 time, you put that together and you get uh, n2, n4, n1 plus n3. Okay. Now, as I've drawn it, um, n3 and n1 are the big dimensions and n2 and n4 are small. Okay. So this, you know, the nice thing is that I'm taking the small one squared times the big dimension for this one. Whereas in the first choice, I'm kind of taking the big dimension squared. So I've drawn it so n1 is equal to n3 times two times the small one. Okay, so as the pictures maybe represent just based on the size of the intermediate matrices, uh, the second approach where I multiply the last two matrices first will actually use far fewer operations than the first, you know, especially as I exaggerate the difference between uh, and one and three and and two and four. Okay, so computationally, in terms of running time, it does matter which pairs you pick to multiply first. Okay. All right, so here then is the is the problem I'm interested in. Your input is actually not really the matrices because I'm not interested in the contents of the matrices. It's just the dimensions of the matrices. Okay, so I give you some numbers, n1, n2, up through nk plus one or something, representing the dimensions of k matrices. So this one would be like an n1 by n2 matrix. This would be an n2 by n3 matrix. It's so an n3 by n4 matrix and so forth. So the dimensions you know, line up and that product is well defined. And now my goal is to figure out the best way to combine all these matrices and minimize the number of multiplication operations. Okay. So I just I want to figure out how to sort of put parentheses on two matrices at a time uh, to minimize that total sum of you know single number multiplications. Okay, so. You know, there's all these 
different things one can do. You can like multiply these first, and then uh, you know multiply that, multiply that, and then multiply that, and maybe you do this. Okay, you know that's just one possible kind of multiplication strategy. To gradually combine everything together. In particular, your your output. I mean, at some level, every uh, chain multiplication strategy can be represented as like a sequence of nested parentheses that are kind of wrapping up two matrices at a time. You can also visualize this as like a tree. Okay, like here's some matrices and I, I parenthesize them. And so, you know, you can look at the roots, right? And figure out what sort of is that most outermost parentheses and the outermost parentheses are these, okay? And that splits it up into two sub problems. And going here, you know, what are the, the outermost parentheses? Okay, that's here and here. That splits it into two problems, the two problems uh, and stuff like that, right? So these parentheses should also be defining kind of like a tree-like structure that kind of shows you how you're merging these matrices together. Okay, so that's two ways to visualize a strategy. For this problem, I'm, I'm principally interested in the minimum number of multiplications that are needed. Afterwards, we can talk about how to reverse engineer or how to extract the actual strategy. We have time. All right, so, all right, so that's the problem. And I think we have enough time. Does anyone have any ideas of the best way to go about computing matrices? So basically what we want to do is to uh, find uh, pairs of matrices, neighboring matrices, uh, such that uh, uh, row, uh, the number of rows and the number of columns for each mat matrix is the smallest. Okay, so this is describing sort of like a greedy strategy. So at some level, if I know that the number of rows in the first one is small and the number of columns in the second one is small, then this is going to output something that looks like a square, right? So maybe as a greedy strategy, you can kind of try to find small intermediate matrices. So first you have to define what it means to be smallest because you know you can have like one that sort of looks like this and the other one that kind of looks like this and like it's one not strictly bigger or smaller than the other. Okay, so there's sort of a greedy strategies, but in general, any greedy strategy you pick, one can actually come up with um, a counterexample um, for uh, various reasons. Uh, for example, this will also output the same square, so it's also not clear which one to pick. Okay. So, okay, so there's kind of greedy strategies that are local, uh, but they do actually tend to be flawed. What's a non-greedy, more conservative, perhaps less clever approach. So instead of multiplying, first we can see if we multiply what dimensions I will get. So I can do this for all the possible multiplications. And then oh, can... absolutely, yeah. So we when we're doing uh, when we're kind of simulating or imagining multiplications, we're not actually doing the multiplication, right? Because I, I just know that this is going to take that uh, this is going to take n1 times n2 times n3 time, and it's gonna produce something of dimensions n1 times n3. So you don't actually have to do the multiplication to A, calculate how many steps you would need and the output dimensions. That's absolutely true. Yeah, so I'm never actually doing the multiplication. So my goal is to just come up with a strategy to figure out, um, to figure out what's the minimum number of multiplication, individual multiplications I would need to do. Okay, so okay, so I see some recursive strategies suggested in. Okay, okay, so let's try the first idea. 
recurs based on whether you multiply the first two or not. Okay. So, okay, we can try that. So, okay. So on one hand, if I multiply these two together, and then I recurse on one best matrix. Okay, so that's one possibility. Okay, so what happens if they don't multiply together? So what if I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to multiply these two. What would my sub problems look like? Okay, so I can try to put all of these together. So I think you're suggesting, okay, now I just try to compute all of those as much as possible and then multiply it with this. Is that what you have in mind? Okay. All right, so that was to like give a strategy, but it's not all possible strategies, right? Because for example, move this out of the way, maybe, you would want to somehow multiply these three together by some strategy. I don't know which one comes first. And then take that and then multiply these together and then figure out the rest, right? So that possibility is excluded from the two cases that we just went through. So even if we don't multiply the first two together, we might still want to multiply it soon with maybe some other intermediate matrix. Okay, so that recursion doesn't quite enumerate all the possibilities. Can we try to divide the number of matrices into two group, two groups and try to recursively find out the minimum uh, multiplications in each group? Ah, okay, so if we go to this um, tree, we could try to figure, we know there's some outer parentheses, right? At the top level, it's going to split the sequence into two groups, right? So we can try to guess what is the outermost parentheses, right? Maybe it's there. Maybe it's over here. Maybe it's here, right? I don't know, but we're saying that at the end, the last step of the chain multiplication will be multiplying the product of the left times the product of the right group. And how do we get the left? We'll do it optimally recursively. How do we get the right? We'll do it optimally recursively. So it's a different way to kind of nibble away at the problem. It's a little bit, I think, more subtle than what we did for edit distance. Edit distance is clear, you go from left to right. Okay. All right. So how much time do we have? Okay, so let's just kind of walk through the steps um, just for good practice. Okay, who wants to suggest a recursive spec, a sentence? So I'll fix uh, the dimensions n1 through nk plus one globally, right? So that's already given to you as input. Okay. So how might I define a subproblem? You can have something like number of uh like minimum ways to compute uh minimum ways to multiply uh given matrix uh uh a matrix A um from I I to J. Okay, good. So you, you mentioned I J so this is often, uh, this is really the hardest part. The minimum number of operations to multiply uh, AI, sorry, AI through AJ. Okay. All right, so why do I think this is the hardest part? You know, because this part where you've identified IJ is also where you figured out like what the sub problems look like, right? And so this is not as, you know, this is different than before. So, you know, before we did something like edit distance, our sub problems were, were kind of simpler because they were always like suffixes, right? Here was a sub problem, here was a sub problem, there was a sub problem, something like that. Here we have a different structure and that's implicit. I mean, that's made clear by the recursive spec. Once you write it this way, now you know your sub problems look more like this. 
That's different than before. And by the time you've written this sentence, you actually have figured out a lot of structure of this problem. So for, for dynamic programming, I think often, I think many of the examples we had in class, the sentence was almost very straightforward, the only possible sentence. Here, figuring out the right way to decompose your problem into the right subproblems is like 99% of the battle. A lot of it is occurring right here. Oh, so can I, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, here, uh, the input index indices are I and J. And yes, does it mean uh, it considers two matrices? Two matrices. Yeah, it could be. It could be AI, AI plus one. I mean, it, this. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I and J, it's like, uh, in general, we considering, we are co considering. Oh, so maybe there's a bad notation. So I meant to, this was supposed to be the whole list of everything in between. I, I see. Uh, but the, uh, I, yeah, in, in that case, I, I'm confused. Uh, in that case, I think. Uh -huh. Uh, considering uh, mm, these uh, n matrices as arguments for the uh, th this should be uh, uh, arguments for the function. Oh, okay, so so uh yeah so at some level this I, is already uh, uh probably i i understand it uh you because we want to uh we want to consider that something like this so just uh this uh I and J means uh, from I to J. And, yeah, yeah, so uh, yes. Uh, and then we, uh, after the second, in the recursive calls, we, we will do I to J, uh, I to K, and uh, K to J, K plus one to J. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, how about this? If maybe if we see a few more of the, the next couple, if we see the code, then maybe that will fill in the gaps and you'll see how it fits in. Yes. Let's see if that helps. It might help, I'm not sure. We can come back to this. Yeah. Okay, all right, so okay. So there, there's a sentence, right? That's, I think that's the same I had, okay. So, okay, so uh, I'm just looking at consecutive subsequences of my original sequence of a matrix I'm multiplying together. All right. If I wanted to implement this relatively quickly, given time, all right, how might we do this? Don't be shy because we don't have too much time. So this is the minimum of the, oh, probably, yeah, someone posted the answer, but. Uh, okay, enumerate all the possible ways to split. Yes, let's quickly do some base cases though. Uh, so. If i is greater than j, you just return zero. So if there's only one matrix or if there's uh, you know, less than one matrix, you don't have to do any operations. Okay. All right. Else, maybe we can return the minimum over all possible splitting points. So something like uh, L from i to J, where, so we're going to split, right? We have AI up to AL, AL plus one up to AJ. So actually, this is important. You actually want to loop from I to J minus one. Otherwise, you're going to infinite loop. So that's a common, like, small bug. And then we're going to guess splitting here. Okay. So you pay. Fastest 
IL to compute the first group plus fastest, L plus one J to compute the second group. Okay. And then this is going to have NI dimensions, NI rows, and NL plus one columns. And the second one is going to have NL plus one rows and NJ plus one columns. So to compute the final multiplication at the end will be NI times NL plus one times NJ plus one. All right, so you recur on the two, two sides, and then you multiply them together, or you figure out how many, how long it would take. Okay, so that's that's the code. The point is that it's very simple. Okay. Well, the structure is more complicated because we're splitting things up. All right, so that would be step two, right? There's our recursive implementation. Uh, step three. Right? How would we use the recursive algorithm to solve the problem? So just write something like, oh, you know, ultimately we want to return fastest. Uh, I think the input is k numbers, k matrices. So fastest 1k will, will tell you the minimum for all the original k matrices. Okay. All right, so that's fine. And now let's figure out uh, what the running time would be if I throw dynamic programming onto it, if I cache everything. Okay, so if I have saved all my answers on this relatively simple recursive code, how many sub problems are there? So I should note that there's, there's K input matrices or yeah. K square. Okay, yeah, so I I goes from one to K, J goes from one to K. That gives us K squared. How much time do I spend on each sub problem? O1? Okay. Why O1? So I guess this takes O1, right? Uh, but it is sitting in a loop. So there is a loop here of size j minus i, okay, which is at most k. So you, in fact, many of the problems will have roughly length k. So this overestimate is fine. It'll actually take order k time for subproblem because you're looping over uh, all these choices of splits. You put that all together, and what's the overall running time? Excellent. Okay, you put that all together, we get k cubed. Okay, so we have we have k squared subproblems because they're all defined by sub consecutive subsequences, and then you have k time per problem because you're looping through and finding all the splits. Okay, so that is the solution of of this. I didn't really write the proof because we kind of went through it together. Um, all right. Okay, those are the two applications I had. Any questions about matrix chain multiplication? Or anything else? All right, that's all I have today. Thanks for uh, hanging out. Thanks to everyone who um, put their camera on. That was terrific. I, I, <laughs> I remember last year it was all blank. It was so sad. So I, I appreciate that um, very much. It helped me a lot. Thanks, guys. Well, I just have one last question. So that K yeah. will be conceptually actually N, right? So uh, well, the, the input actually consists of K matrices. I, I reserved N for those dimensions of the oh, matrices. Oh, OK, OK, that's why. Yeah. All right, but that's the, OK. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Uh, for each subproblem, it doesn't take k steps, right? So can we, but the worst case is k, but uh, for one subproblem, but can we 
to make it somewhat better because it doesn't take Sure. So, so if we want it to be really detailed, right, we would be summing over all choices of i less than j, uh, j minus i, right? That would be the actual running time or something like this. This would be a refined count. So I'm summing over all the possible choices of indices and then how long that loop would take, right? Yeah. So I want to argue that actually k is going to be fine. So for example, this is at least summing over all values of i from one to, I don't know, k over four, and summing all values of j from three, I don't know if this, you guys can see this, um, go away, uh, three k, 3k over 4 up to k, right? So I'm only looking at some of the indices from the original sum, j minus i, right? So all I've done is drop some entries, so that's greater than equal. But this thing is always at least what? For these indices? k by 2. k by 2, OK? And how many choices, how many entries are in this sum? Oh, k by four? Yeah, there's there's k by four choices for i, there's k by four choices for j, right? So that's already at least uh, k divided by four times k divided by four times k divided by two, right? So this thing is at least some constant times k cubed. So that overestimate actually isn't that bad because there's still plenty of entries uh, where it's close to k. Oh, okay, yeah, makes sense. It's a good trick uh, to be aware of. And, and, and note that I didn't have to use that sophisticated of an argument to pull that off because I don't care about constants. Any other questions? Um, quickly, uh, what does the n sub i, n sub k plus one, n sub j uh, actually like compute in this example? I, I don't know if you said that, but I, I might have missed it. Yeah, this was, um, I actually, it's better in this picture. K was L before, but so in other words, uh, so here I'm using L instead of K. I probably shouldn't have used K because that was, anyway. So this is just L instead. I don't know if the handwriting is a little worse. So ni times nl plus one times nj plus one. So the idea is that we guess where to split it, right? So I'm guessing that I'm going to split it between al and al plus one. So ai through al on one side, al plus one through aj on the other. And now, sorry, you know, if I want to find the best way to multiply these things, I'm recursively calling fastest il. So that's this first term. And then recursively here, that's fastest L plus one, J. So that's this term. And then now here comes your term. At the end of the day, when I move these two matrices, so recursively, I mean, those two groups are going to produce two matrices, right? And the dimension of this matrix, it's going to have the same number as rows as AI. So that's NI. And it's going to have the same number of columns as AL. So it's going to have NL plus one columns. If I look at the second matrix from the second group, uh, second group, then you're going to have the same number of rows as AL plus one. So that's NL plus one row. NL plus one rows. And you're going to have the same number of columns as AJ. So you're going to have AJ plus one columns. So at the end, when you multiply those two matrices together, the number of operations you need is Ni times Nl plus 1 times Nj plus 1. So the last term represents merging those last two groups together. Gotcha. Thank you.
somebody enables closed captioning, I don't know what will happen. Yeah, that was me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to find out really quickly. Yeah. Um, with respect to the two examples we looked at today, we mm -hmm. looked at the calculation of distance of strings, right? And yeah. we looked at the calculation of matrices, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are there any applications of these kind of recursive algorithms outside these two examples? Oh, there's a ton. There's a ton. And actually, uh, as you guys will find out, uh, there's an infinite number of fun homework problems or exercises for using dynamic programming. Uh, so, OK, you'll see a lot of goofy ones. Um, uh, and uh, especially, you know, later on focusing on just problems that are sort of defined on sequences, uh, okay. you know, like chain sequence of matrices or or sequence of, of you know, the strings, because that's relatively simple structure. But later we'll, we'll extend the same ideas to graphs. Uh, and, and so you can actually model a lot more stuff and, and still use the same, same tricks. We have to learn some more stuff to get to that point. And then you really see a lot of ideas um, <laughs> blow up. Okay. So um, I I know of a you know graph isomorphism, right? Okay. And uh, that's basically trying to calculate the distance or let's say the similarity between two graphs, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, would you say um, that like that topic on its own has some relationship with especially the uh you know like edit distance calculations we did here or you know it's a you know like it's a realm on its own <laughs> yeah so so graph iso isomorphism is like just for for those who you know don't know you're given as input two graphs and they don't, the vertices aren't labeled with anything, right? So you don't really know. And you want to know if the two graphs are the same, which means can you match up the vertices so that the edges also become the same everywhere? So this is a really simple picture. You can clearly see that because there's a different number of edges in one graph and the other, they're obviously different, okay? Mm -hmm. But it could be much bigger, okay? And, and it becomes much harder. So that's called this graph isomorphism problem, okay? This is a notoriously hard problem. Hey, it's also very unique. We will we don't we haven't defined this yet because it's but it's in something called P and co NP anyway. Okay, so we don't have so okay to some extent, right? Graph by isomorphism is trying to figure out how similar two graphs are. That seems similar in spirit to what we did with strings. Mm -hmm. okay. But we're not even close to coming up with a good algorithm. I mean a polynomial time algorithm for graph by isomorphism, though we suspect there might exist one someday. But again, that's actually a pretty recent breakthrough. Someone, someone recently got a running time of the form, like uh, two to the log n. Wow. Ten or something. But, I mean, whatever. You got you got a, you got a sub exponential algorithm only recently in the past like five years. It's like one of the biggest results in the past five years. Um, so what's what 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 I can suggest at a high level is that. Edit distance, okay, it might have seemed complicated when we're presenting at the same time, but the sequences have a relatively simple structure. You know, it was clear when we're doing edit distance, we should go from left to right, right? When we're looking at graphs, it's like, uh, I can start with this vertex, and then which vertex do I start over here? Should I start with this one? Should I start with that one? Even that's not clear. There's really not as much structure and ordering. It's not obvious how to go about this kind of thing. So even though it's similar, Graph isomorphism is incredibly difficult, okay? We don't have such simple structures that we can rely on. At least at the moment, maybe we'll discover something. Whereas edit distance, because it's all sequences and sequences are, you know, you can only do so much. There's only two directions, right? Like on a sequence, you can go left, you can go right. And, and so somehow, you know, we don't have a dynamic programming algorithm for graph isomorphism. We do for edit sequence. And, but this points to a more general question, which we'll really attack after midterm one. Why do some of these techniques like dynamic programming work for some problems that seem simple and not work for others that also seem simple? Okay, so there'll also be plenty of problems that 
at least in my opinion, seem just as simple as the problems we did today, but we don't have good algorithms. And in fact, we have things suggesting that they should be hard. But that will come later. The first part of the course is first figuring out how to solve the problems we can't solve. And then later we'll worry about what happens when some of our techniques fall short in trying to understand why we don't have a great answer for why, but still trying to get some feel for why. Okay. That, that will all happen after midterm one. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's a very good, deep question. Uh, quick question. When is winter midterm one exactly? I'm actually kind of curious. Uh, it should be in the schedule, but it should be after five weeks of class. Those five weeks of class, midterm one, four weeks of class, midterm two, four weeks of class, final. It's roughly put into thirds. Okay. Yeah. The, even the, the date and time and the room should all be in the schedule on the beginning of the book. Of course, of course, website. Probably a uh, Thursday night book. Yeah. Uh, can, can you please explain why, I think I missed this part, so why for per sub problem the time is K? You mentioned like uh, there is a loop, but like I, I just didn't follow that part. Sure, so I, I, I didn't really write out the loop uh, explicitly because I just kind of expressed the function of what's going on, but you return the minimum over all choices of K, that was L in the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I'm trying all values of K. So this is where there's, I didn't call it a loop, but this is secretly a loop where I'm trying all these different values of K between I and J minus one. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. All yeah. right. Okay, it's that a, makes sense. A, yes. Yeah. Okay. Now it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Be careful of that too, because it's not uncommon when we write our solutions that we forget in the minimum there is a loop and we we miscalculate our running time. That's like the most common, you know, natural mistake, you know, that, okay. that we see. Okay, all right. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah.